Welcome to our podcast. This is Friends on Fire. I'm Mike. I'm a lifelong devotee of financial independence. I even wrote a book about it. And I'm Maggie, a newer convert, but just as passionate, especially on the intersection of minimalism and financial independence. We're one in the same. We are two like-minded friends who believe that talking about money with your friends and family opens the door to financial well-being. The Friends on Fire podcast is about dispelling myths, building financial acumen, and sharing your financial independence journey with the people you care about. This is Friends on Fire. Hey, Maggie. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Happy Friday. Thanks. It's Friday night. There's nothing I would rather do than talk life insurance with you. <laughs> I know. This is what I've been looking forward to all week. It is, uh, it's been a long week. It's been a good week, though. Yeah, I guess. I'm mean, busy. But I mean, good. it's been like every other week for the past year. It's a new year. What do you mean every other week? It's I don't like know. 2021. It feels now. exactly the same. Oh, I feel like I'm I am in a better mental state during the month of January than I was during November and December. So, I am feeling though busy, very good about things, oh. work and personal. I feel just as good as I did in November and December. I think oh, that's okay. the difference. Well, I don't think you ever had like a I was having like a I was I was just on the verge of like extreme burnout mm-hmm. in November and December, and things are not necessarily any less crazy, but they are just. I, you know what it is. You know one of the things that I think it is. Did you just have an epiphany like on the spot? I kind of did, but I actually had this epiphany like almost every day for the past week. <laughs> I just remembered what it was. I don't think that makes it an epiphany. No, it's but I not. just remembered it right now okay. because we were talking about this. So you know one of my goals this year is to meditate daily. My, mm-hmm. my specific goal is 350 times this year. I, I worded it that way so I could have some flexibility if I miss a day to pick it up. Okay. That means I get 15 off days. That is a hu- That is an incredibly aggressive goal for me because I used to meditate daily years ago. And then particularly over the past year, I really fell off the wagon and like barely would get in one a week, a lot of weeks. Point is, guess how many days I've meditated? It's the 15th today. 18 times. Why are you going to guess aggressively? I thought that's the point you were going to try to make. No, no, no. Just doing it once a day is a really big feat. Me not not falling off the wagon for for 15 days is great. 13 days out of 15. Okay, there you go. That's a good guess. 14. Oh, good job. I hate when I like make my husband guess something and then he like guesses way aggressive. I'm like, well, now I feel bad that I haven't met that goal. (laughs) So guessing games with me are never good. Yeah, 14 out of 15 days, and I feel it. I I, I, oh, I know, it's why I said that was one of my biggest goals. I know for a fact I feel better, I am better when I am meditating consistently, and it works. Okay, so I'm excited about this topic because there are a few, you know what, we, I didn't even like ask how you are, right? You said you're fine, right? Okay, let's move on. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Let's keep going with the show. You said you're the same that you are like every week. Yeah. Okay. There are a few topics in the financial realm that I get passionately angry about. One of them is whole life insurance. Is it whole term or whole? It's called whole, whole life. Whole life insurance. And then one of them is uh, percentage based financial planners. There's probably a couple more, but those are like two of my like. I'll get like angry about that, like fired up about how terrible I think they are. And I frequently will kind of reference it in episodes, but we haven't actually done an episode on it. So I'm excited to finally talk about life insurance, everything about it from whether you need it to what type you should have to how much you need, all that stuff we're going to talk through. And this kind of reminds me of an email we got a few weeks ago from a listener, Tim, I believe his name was, where he was challenging us on some of our biases about value-based investing. Oh, yeah. And one mm-hmm. of his criticisms was that we we kind of oversimplified some stuff and we're pushing what our belief was. And uh, so I thought it'd be appropriate to give a little disclaimer. We are definitely doing that tonight. You and oh. I have an agenda. <laughs> we are biased. <laughs> we are going to share our opinion about this stuff. Yes. So before we get started... It's always fun to read messages or listen to voicemails from listeners. So we did get a funny one today, and uh, I want to play it for you right now. Maggie and Mike, it's Detective Matt from Chicago. I've heard you mention my wife and I on some recent podcasts, and I just want to say you guys do an awesome job. 
Mike, we love your book, too. Keep up the good work, and we look forward to hearing future shows. Stay safe and stay on fire. So I love that. That is Matt, and I have talked about him a bunch of times on the show. He is married to Lisa, one of my best friends from AT&T. And in case you guys haven't picked up on it, like if you are in our social orbit, you know, of Mike and Maggie, you end up getting referenced usually by name on this show. I like to think it's kind of a, we give you a little celebrity quality. I'm not sure other people feel that way. Yeah. Celebrity status. Also, you know, I'm like fascinated by crime shows and detectives and like, I would like to talk to him sometime. That'd be nice. (laughs) So you'll be like, you'll be like, tell me about all the dead bodies you've seen. And him yeah, be like, I actually, wanna... I really want to talk about insurance, Maggie. Can we, can we be like, over? first you tell me about all of the, uh, I just want to know like what his life is like when he deals with it. And is it like the TV shows or is it totally different? I don't know. I've asked people in the medical profession this about whether their life is like Grey's Anatomy. And I actually hear that it is relatively similar at times Mm -hmm. so i like to think that he's straight out of an episode of you know law and order svu who knows well i will ask him and see and see what he says it's funny that he called in now because one of the first things that i helped his wife with was eliminating her whole life insurance policy with northwestern mutual i think it was and Just kind of, you know, jumping ahead a little bit. This is sort of like a scammy product. And, you know, I took her through in great detail how this program works. She had been feeling guilty about it for a decade and eventually helped her cancel the policy, get a lot of her cash back. And she's never felt better about it. You know, you've done that for two people because we'll we'll share that story later for someone else. Yeah, it's relatively easy to convince people to get out of those programs. (laughs) But anyway, Matt, thank you for calling in. <laughs> Appreciate the kind words. And yes, we look forward to having much. you on for a future show when you can tell Maggie about all the crazy, sick crime that you've witnessed. Yeah, we'll try to figure out a way to tie in your detective work to uh, financial advice. I'm sure there's <laughs> something. Okay, so let's let's jump in to life insurance. I always like to start with sharing our own personal experiences with life insurance. Mike, do you have life insurance? Uh, I have just like basic life insurance through work that's paid for. I don't have any additional life insurance. Okay. Interesting. What about you? Well, have you ever considered life insurance or have you always had that approach? I've purchased it through work when it was extremely cheap, but that was also earlier in my life. And But you've never done like your own policy? No. Okay. I think I've made it pretty clear that I am anti-insurance of yeah. all kinds. I think the whole industry is just a scam. I'm jumping ahead. Maggie, well, tell me about... Sc- I mean, it's a money... Ma- it, it is a capitalistic... It's making money. They're making money off you. That's, so. that's true. Some I think, people pay off from it and some people don't. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, let's okay. we'll move on. So I do have life insurance. I have term life insurance, which we'll talk about the different types in a minute. Um, and I actually just recently, like in the past two months, changed, like canceled a previous policy and got a new policy, which I'll talk about later and saved a ton of money. But I have life insurance. And also, if you are divorced, you often have a clause in your divorce agreement that you have to carry life insurance um, to have your child slash kind of ex be the beneficiary. Um, and so it's a co- fairly common requirement. And so I actually do have to have it. So there are three basic types of life insurance. And the, there's two that I think are the most prominent. First is term life. So I think what people are most familiar with, and that's basically you pay a monthly premium for a fixed payment. So you pay $50 a month for a $1 million policy that lasts for a fixed term, term period of time. Could be 10 years, could be 20 years. Yeah. And they're fairly inexpensive. They are advertised everywhere. To be super clear, this is the only type we would ever recommend. Mike doesn't even recommend term life. I, I actually think it can be important. We'll talk about why. But we would. this is the only one we would really recommend that anyone consider. It's called term life. And again, you're paying that fixed premium or sometimes m- monthly premium or sometimes annual premium. And it's for a fixed period of time. And then it basically expires, right? So if you buy a 10-year policy at the end of 10 years, you no longer have life insurance. You would then have to re-up and it would be a totally different rate because you'd be at a different age and health status and all of that. 
I would not recommend it to everybody, but like we've discussed on other insurance episodes about car insurance or extended warranty programs or anything, you have to understand what your needs and what the possibilities yeah, exactly. are in your life and, and then make a You're appropriate right. decision. That's a better statement. It's more that you don't need it and we'll kind of get into why. Yeah. All right. Next one. The one we despise is whole life insurance. There's no term. It's your whole life, but you get a payout at death um, as long as you keep paying your premiums. And it's expensive. Super scammy. Super scammy. Ultra complicated. And this is by design. And, you know, my my friend Lisa, you know, we were talking about earlier how she got into this policy. She got it when she was younger. She was single and basically just kind of sold in by some very aggressive insurance guy to buy this policy. The salespeople get huge commissions. Anytime a company is paying a large commission to a salesperson and anytime that you are paying a lot of money and not seeing a benefit, you know, like that profit is going towards the company. And so that should be an immediate giveaway that this is probably a little bit better for the company than it is for you. Mike, try to explain why whole life is a scam and such a bad idea. It's basically like you pay these premiums every single year that are very large. Like like thousands, multiple thousands of dollars versus maybe like $1,000 for a term life insurance policy. And it goes into this account, which you cannot access, and it grows at a certain rate. They will tell you when you when you get the prospectus, when you sign up, they'll say, like, look at this rosy picture of how much this could grow to. Those those returns are not guaranteed, but it grows at maybe three or four percent every single year. And then when you die, it's this this payout. But the but the thing is like you could also just put money into an investment account and do much better than this plan. And you when you put money into an investment account, it's your money. Yeah. No whenever you want. When you put this in, like you don't get it until you die. Right. And then well, in which case you don't get it. But a lot of people tout these as a lot of these like aggressive salespeople, they tout this as an investment vehicle for people. So so I've been sold it, but I've I've never purchased it, but I had a financial planner like years and years ago, a decade ago, who didn't even sell this as a life insurance product. They sold it as an additional diversification, diversifying way to have additional places to invest my money, which is another reason why it's a bad idea. Because it, when you stack it up against any other place you can invest your money, it just it doesn't ever win. Yeah. Bottom line is they give you a marginal return on investment and this account grows. They also tout this thing where they call it like tax-free earnings where you can take a loan out from the policy, which is super confusing and not a great deal. I think if if anybody ever gets into a situation where someone is trying to aggressively sell you a product and it is so complicated that you can't comprehend it even after maybe, you know, 10 or 20 minutes of like reading documentation, it is a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah. So good investments should make sense to you. They should be pretty clear. They shouldn't need to be aggressively sold by somebody who's making money on that sale. I think this is worth reinforcing, Mike. Your comment about your, you know, your story with your friend Lisa. So a lot of people who have already bought a whole life insurance policy, which is many people because there are very aggressive salespeople that allow, often even hit people at a young age and kind of convince them of something they don't fully understand. A lot of people think, oh, well, I already have it. I've paid 20 grand into it over a number of years, whatever it might be. They, they think that they're already kind of like they've got a sunk cost into it. They don't want to get out of it. But for many people, that's not actually true. For many people, even if you're many, many years into a whole life policy, it still makes sense to cash out and get out of it. Um, and you actually do get some money back, right, when you cash out of it. Yeah, there's, there's a point many years in where the balance of your account flips and is worth more than you put in. But that's like, I'm making this up, 30 years in. And so my friend was maybe 15 or 20 years into this policy. And by taking it out, she was going to basically lose some of the money that she had put in. And it was a reasonable amount of money. It was thousands of dollars. But still, like it was kind of a no-brainer because she could take it out and make that up within six months in the stock market yeah. and then do exponentially better over time because she was only making, I want to say when we actually looked at the returns, it was like one or 2% a year. It was terrible. Yeah. 
And again, she's never going to see that money, right? Most people who have these policies, on average, are going to live well past into their 70s, 80s, 90s. And at that point, you what are you going to do with this, you know, massive nest egg of like what really no. is kind of a bad investment versus alternatives? Anyway, we've bashed whole life. I think we've made our <laughs> point. Yes. The third type, which I don't think many people consider life insurance, is accidental death and dismemberment plans. It's funny. When you first put this in, I was like, I would never have put that under the category of life insurance. It's like a cousin to life insurance. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess you look on the family tree of insurance plans. Yeah. So this one, similar to other ins- life insurance policies, they pay you upon your death or if you have some sort of gruesome injury, like you lose a hand. And there's what about, all- I think I feel like we've had this discussion. Like, what if you lose a finger? Yeah, they'll pay you something. But if you okay. if you lose but one finger, finger's worth. but if you lose two fingers, they'll pay you a little bit more. They have like okay. a whole schedule. It's kind of funny. And if you lose a whole hand, wow. Yeah. Like what? What person sits around at an insurance company and is like, let me tell you what a pinky is going to be worth versus two fingers versus. I mean, if you lose your index finger, that's a big one. So. I don't know. I if I, I bet there's like one person at each company and her name is Dolly and she's like super sweet and like very positive, but she spends her whole day like thinking about calculating the yeah. cost of what, what losing a finger is worth to you. So anyway, Moving they pay on. they pay upon death caused by an accident. So if you die by a heart attack, you don't get paid. If you die in a car accident, you get the policy. But it's interesting because these are by far the cheapest plans. And For healthy people, like the way I view it, I have a very low likelihood of dying of some sort of natural cause. But you have a high likelihood of dying in your 2003 Ford Explorer. Oh, yeah. Like it's it's a it's a driving death trap. Um, Good thing I don't drive very much. (laughs) I drive like 2000 miles a year. So, yes, I, I am so much more likely to die in a car accident than die of natural causes. And these plans are a lot cheaper, so it actually makes more sense for me to get a AD&D, Accidental Death and Dismemberment Plan. And then there's another thing that is not at all life insurance, but I think it's just an interesting point to make related to the life insurance discussion. I, I had never heard of this or realized it existed until three or four years ago, but it's called long-term disability insurance. And I was fascinated when I learned about it because, Mike, like your comment of saying you have a higher chance of getting in a car accident than you do of dying. I don't know if that's actually like a true stat, but... Uh, probably. Oh, it's definitely true. Oh, there we go. True stat. Uh, and not Maggie data. But the point is you have it. You also have a higher likelihood of getting having some sort of an injury or getting disabled than you do of dying. And and what's interesting about that is, you know, life insurance is for other people. But if you were to get injured and you could no longer work, long term disability insurance replaces your salary and provides you income if something like if you were to get really injured or sick short term or long term. Um, And it's interesting because, again, we're not going to cover this in depth, but I do think it's an interesting thing for people to consider who have concerns about how their family might get taken care of if they were to get seriously injured, because there is a higher likelihood of you getting injured versus dying. And so it's worth kind of looking into long term disability insurance. And it's something that we can we can maybe do a future episode on, you know, if something like that is. Oh, yeah. Sounds super fun. Long term (laughs) disability insurance. Sign me up. Uh, And I actually got rejected for this when I tried to sign up for it a few years ago. Why? Well, because I guess every company is different, but they considered something that I have a pre-existing condition and it's not really. And even my doctor argued it wasn't. But vocal fry. (laughs) <laughs> not vocal fry have we ever even talked about that on here vocal fry yeah, yeah all did the we time talk about it? i didn't think we talked about it i know you and i talked about it no I remember we, we got a comment like early oh, on well, i know we got a comment made, but did you we ever it, made you it? super self-conscious and it you brought did. it up like every week for the next oh, six right. episodes that was at the beginning of 2020 and it was it feels like such a long time ago yeah so vocal like fry pre-existing condition got yeah, it that was not it but haha um, anyways, I, there's some weird rule at our company that if you you can they'll take a pre-existing condition when you first start working for the company, but if you do it like five years later, they won't they won't give you coverage for a pre-existing condition, which okay. is like a ridiculous loophole. But anyways, I didn't want that type of insurance. Anyways, okay, let's talk about whether you need life insurance. Back to our discussion at the very beginning of why you don't have it. Yeah. So all kinds of insurance or warranty plans for your TV or whatever, you need to understand two things. How likely are you to need it? And then how much do you actually need the benefit? 
if you have some $20 toaster that you buy, you don't really need to buy some sort of extended warranty plan for $5 because if it breaks, you just go buy a new toaster. It's $20. It's not a big deal. But medical insurance, if something bad happens to you, it could be like a million dollars to go get some sort of heart surgery or something. That kind of cash you probably don't have. And so the benefit's worth it to you. Now, when it comes to life insurance, you're really trying to replace the future earnings you'd have so that your family doesn't suffer. So if you have a dual income house and you lose, you know, 20 years of income from working, that could be quite devastating for a family. Now, Maggie, you've been mentioning in this episode that I don't, I'm not a huge proponent of it. I don't really need it. And it's because I don't plan on working that long anyway. My future yeah. income is going to be quite low, if anything. And so right now I have, I have like a reasonable policy through work that's sub, that's paid for. I have AD and D. I have life insurance. It's fine for me. I don't pay for anything else. So Mike, one of the, Th- the comment you just made about you don't plan on working that much longer. If you are at or close to being financially independent and you have, you know, aggressively saved and you've got a lot in, you know, all of your different savings vehicles, your mortgage is paid off, et cetera. That's a, that's a real life scenario that you're in where you really don't need life insurance because to your point, your family would have what they needed if something were to happen to you, you mm-hmm. know, in the short term. Um, and again, the whole point of it is to make up for what you would have provided to your family. And uh, I'm it's one of the reasons that I recently lowered my amount also, because I, I have to keep a certain amount of it. But at the same time, I, I had way more than I needed. I was overinsured and I was paying a lot as a re- I was paying more than I needed to as a result. So speaking of cost, let's talk about how much life insurance will cost people. So it obviously can vary greatly depending on your age, your number of years, the, the number of years that you want the term for, your current health situation, whether you have pre-existing conditions, then the company that's quoting you. So it's like all insurance rates in the sense that it just can can vary, very can vary, very widely. It's a lot of varies. You know what I mean? It I know can what vary you a lot. Yeah. Um, what I think is interesting, because I, I was kind of in my head just based on my own experience saying, it was going to cost, it could cost you anywhere from, you know, $10 a month to 200 plus a month. Again, depending on whether you have a lot of pre existing conditions, if you're higher risk, whatever. But I saw an interesting article on Nerd Wallet today that said that the average cost of insurance in 2020 for the, again, this is for the average person. So this is not, um, this is average, could be high, could be low was $26 a month, which I thought was an interesting number because it's kind of in line with uh, what I what I would have thought also. So I think like all products that you buy from companies, you have to do your research and shop around for rates. And you know I love reading fine print, Maggie. This is mm-hmm. one of those things where you should really read the fine print because if you're buying something that suits your personal needs, so what you think your family needs, what you believe you are likely to, suffer from or when the fine print could include or exclude important details. So you do have to read it when you're shopping around. Right. And don't try to answer questions when you're applying for life insurance to try to get a cheaper rate. That's not how it works. Like you can't lie about smoking because they'll void your policy. If you, if you die and there's like evidence that you, you were smoking and you know, you had a pack of cigarettes in your hand (laughs) while you died Yeah. Uh, or anything there's, I, I feel like I saw this on a TV show, but like they find a picture of you on social media smoking and you said you don't smoke, they can void your entire policy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's which is a good reminder. These are companies that make money by taking your money and paying less of it back to customers than they they need to. Yeah. Yeah. So don't mess around. The one point too here is when we talk about, you know, shopping around for things, even if you already have life insurance, it could still be worth it to shop around and reconsider. So if you signed up for a policy, you know, five, 10 years ago and you you thought you got a good setup, which is what I did, you may realize there's a cheaper option. So I don't remember what happened recently. Maybe I might have heard what somebody else was paying and thought, wow, it seems like I'm actually paying a lot. So I was paying about nine hundred dollars a year for a million dollar policy. And I think I started thinking, do I I don't need that much? I've, I'm overinsured based on maybe some discussions with you, Mike. 
And I went and started shopping around and I realized even for the exact same policy, I could get a cheaper rate through USAA, which I have access to because my father-in-law was in the military. And then I realized I also didn't need as much. And so I more than half cut my cost, cut my cost in more than half, less than half, whatever. So why can't I get my words out? I don't know. It's been a long week. Been a long week. I'm paying less than half what I used to be paying for a little bit less than I had. Um, but it, it's just, it's like many things where you even might think you're getting a good deal now. It can't hurt to shop around, even when you're older. I got this policy, you know, five to seven years later, and I'm still paying less on it because I was overpaying with the company that I was with before. So Maggie, I read through your documentation. There's one major exclusion you should be aware of. What? Your policy does not cover death if you fall off your roof while blowing leaves. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, it's not worth it. You know, I recently started paying my yard guys to do that. Because you, you and my husband. <laughs> yeah. So now you need like an umbrella liability insurance policy do, when yeah. they fall off your roof uh-huh, and die. Exactly. That's a whole nother episode. Umbrella policies. Okay. <laughs> to kind of close out the purchase environment of insurance plans, we've talked about it a couple times already, but almost all. All companies that offer benefits packages will offer a whole host of insurance policies. You can get term life, you can get AD&D, you can get disability, you can get policies for your kids and for your spouse. I mean, this is a big money maker for insurance companies and it's a good way for companies to give you like a very robust package. So don't discount those. Look at what's available to you. Definitely look at the prices because in almost all these cases, it's going to be heavily subsidized by the company or it's going to be a better rate that was negotiated for a volume of policies. Um, Just like medical insurance, they do better than you could do on your own. And a lot of these companies, like our company offers you a base amount that covers, sometimes it'll be like a year's worth of your salary or something and that's included, but then you can pay more to get additional insurance. Mm -hmm. I think the thing for people to understand about the policies that come with your benefits at work is that they come with that, but they also leave you when you leave that company. So if you all of a sudden get fired or you leave a company, that day you no longer, often no longer have insurance. Sometimes there's an opportunity that you could continue to pay it at a higher rate with that same company, but often you just don't have it anymore. So you want to be careful about if you're concerned about wanting to insure your your family, you just want to make sure that you understand that that could leave you, you know, that day. And so I, as a result, I prefer to think of what I get through my company as just kind of like extra icing on the cake. And I like having an independent policy that covers me and sticks with me. I don't have to think about it. If I, you know, come and leave a job, then, you know, that insurance policy is still there. All right. So let's talk about when you should get insurance and some other things to consider when making a purchase. The real thing to consider is who relies on you for income and what would their financial situation look like if you were to die. And I think for most people, which is why insurance is globally such a huge industry, people live paycheck to paycheck their entire lives. If they lose one paycheck, that's a big deal. If you lose a lifetime of paychecks, it would be absolutely devastating to a family. And that essentially is what life insurance is trying to protect you against. Yeah. But in this example, if you've got, you know, two partners in a relationship that are married, one of them has a really high salary and one of them doesn't work at all. You might not really need insurance on the person that doesn't work at all. Because again, you're not losing any salary and income if something were to happen to that person versus Mm -hmm. you want to invest your money on the person who has the income that is supporting that family. Yeah. Because that's what you're trying to replace. I think it's also interesting to think about, often people think like, well, how much do I really need? And I remember early on when I considered life insurance thinking of a very small amount. Cause I just was thinking like, Oh, I wasn't thinking about replacing a lifetime of salary. I was just thinking like a little something to make life a little more comfortable in the short term. And I I had someone, I can't remember who, I think it was a friend that was explaining to me, no, think about if something truly were to happen to you tomorrow, how well you would want your family to be taken care of, right? And the quality of life that you would want. Would you want to make sure that your mortgage is fully paid off so that your spouse would not have a single care about that? Would you want to make sure that your kid's college was fully paid for? And and so again, it's such a personal decision of what gives you peace of mind. And and I, I know Mike, you have a very like analytical view of of insurance and you know what that business is. But I do think insurance is like a lot of things to some people that it could be a very emotional decision. Like if it gives you peace of mind, 
and you're like, I, I'm a little more insured than I need to be right now, but I'm paying $36 a month for it. And that gives me peace of mind. I'm willing to do that to know that if something were to happen, there's just, you know, an extra cushion that is provided. One thing to consider, I was just looking at some kind of rough quotes online and I could see a million dollar policy for someone my age who's in great shape is $65 a month for a 25 year policy, million dollars. Okay. So $65 times 12 months times 25 years is 19,500. So I'd be paying $20,000 towards this. And it is a still a very low likelihood that I'm going to die. I hope I don't die tomorrow. And then everybody's like, man, he jinxed himself. But you know, you have to keep in mind that you are paying a considerable amount of money. And then you have your home insurance, you have your car insurance. I mean, over your lifetime, you could be spending, up. you could be spending half a million dollars to insure all this stuff and never need any of it. So even though it might be $50 a month or $100 a month or something that you think is, is really small, do think about what we just discussed. What would really happen to your family? What would they need to be taken care of? for the remainder of their lives. Like put some thought into it. Don't just go through the motions and pick something because somebody is advertising it to you. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And it's a conversation with your partner, right? It's a it's a conversation of what makes you feel comfortable, what makes them feel comfortable. Because they're the one that is left picking up the pieces if something happens to you. So they should feel as good about it as you do it. I think it, I think it truly is a joint decision of of uh, what you decide here. And Mike, on your example, I think I think it's also important as you're shopping around, price out the different options. So when you're doing it, like you just said, a million dollar policy for 25 years, you when you're with, you know, talking to that company, getting quotes, say, okay, well, what would a $750,000 policy be? And what would a $500,000 policy be? And what would it be if it was 20 years? I, I ask all those questions. Mm-hmm. Like you can start to make your own little table and then decide, like often you'll see that I'm making these numbers up, but a 500,000 policy $500,000 policy might be 40 bucks. And then to double it might only be another $15 a month or something. And so you want to kind of weigh like, what is it, what's worth it to you? Right. And that, that's such a personal decision, but just think about it. If it's worth that extra X amount a year to have twice as much for your family and, and just really, you know, think about again, what you need. So if you've already paid off your house and you're a hundred percent debt free, you probably don't need as much life insurance. The other thing to think about in terms of how long you need is often, again, thinking about kind of that quality of life. And so, for example, you know, when I first got a policy, I think I was about 30 and I did like a 30 year policy maybe or something. But but I'm 40 now. And when I just redid my policy, I was thinking, you know, I really don't need anything longer than 20 years because I want to make sure my kids are taken care of until they're adults, which is, you know, 10, 15 years away. And that's really as far out as I'm thinking. And so a lot of times the kind of length of the policy is important to think about. And you can always pull back on a policy. Like you can just stop it at any point, mm-hmm. right? So so if I do a 20 year policy, cause I'm, I'm still, I was gonna say I'm young and healthy, but like I'm, I'm paying a higher rate than a 20 year old's paying. The point is you can stop your policy at any point and just quit paying on it and cancel it, but you can't extend the length of it. You know, so if you if you're not sure if you're like, oh, I don't know if I want 15 years or 20 years, like you can always do a 20 year and just stop paying at 10 years or stop paying at 15 years. Um, but you'll you'll never get as good of a rate as you'll get now because of your age and additional con- health conditions, you know, layering on and things like that. I think the last question and topic we'll cover is so how do you actually get your life insurance? So like we said, like all things, you should shop around with it. I would recommend doing what I do when I want to learn anything. Google it. So you're going to find a million resources online. And I mean, you guys know all the insurance companies already because they advertise to you nonstop. So Google insurance rates. Maggie, you were talking about NerdWallet. That's a great resource for comparison. So recommend going to NerdWallet. Yeah, they've got some great articles and resources. Yeah, exactly. And I think what you're going to find is that all of the policies are pretty similar in the same way that when you shop around for car insurance or homeowner's insurance, they're all about the same. And that's by design because over time, companies see what others are charging and what the coverage is and everything sort of reaches equilibrium. Yeah, I, I will say many of them are about the same, but 
I noticed, like I happened to be with, I was, I had signed up through my Allstate agent. It was, it was like Lincoln life insurance, but it was through Allstate. And when I shopped around, even outside of USAA, I realized I was paying more than I needed to be. And I'm not, I'm not sure if that was just like a premium company or what, but there is value in shopping around because even like car insurance and home insurance, sometimes you'll go to one mm-hmm. company and for your risk profile, they're like significantly more expensive or less expensive. So it is worth, even if you find a company that you like and trust, I wouldn't just like go with Allstate because you have other insurance with Allstate, which is what I did because I was paying twice as much as I needed to for a very long time. No, that that's a great point. And, and I think I think what I was trying to say was that as you go through the comparison process, you will likely find a lot of similarities between these plans and within a group that you are searching for, if you find one that seems to be a good deal, it's unlikely that if you were to expand your search to like 20 insurance providers, you would find something that was significantly better. So doing some shopping around is going to get you a really good deal. Whereas if you were to shop at all places, it might not be any better. That's a great point. And I want one, like one, uh, Pro tip, if you are eligible for USAA, they have some really competitive rates, particularly on life insurance. And so even if you think you're not eligible, like I would never have realized I was eligible. I didn't realize my father-in-law was in the military a really long time ago and it got us access for life to USAA products, which is awesome. So I've actually done this. It's a slightly more specific thing that needs to happen. So the person who was in the military if they don't already have access or membership Mm -hmm. they need to gain membership and then they need to like formally add children or spouses and you get like a pin number and then you need to call in and you activate your account with it um that was something that my dad was in the navy and um and i made and i and i i saw some like really good products that they have and wanted to make sure that I had uh, an account set up for the I didn't future. I know your dad was in the Navy. He didn't tell us that when we interviewed him. I didn't yeah. get his full life story. He was an air traffic controller in Bermuda. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a pretty sweet job in the Navy, too. Yeah. Yeah. It was during it was during Vietnam, and he enlisted, and they're like, where do you want to go? And he's like, Bermuda. <laughs> nice. Yep. Um, okay. The last point around just ha- what the process of getting life insurance looks like. Like once you shop around, you start the process, just so you know, the process itself, once you get your initial quotes, it's a fairly lengthy application process. Usually it's all online, but they ask you just hundreds of questions about like your medical history, lifestyle, all this stuff. And then there is usually an in-person physical in our area. They send somebody to your house, even pre COVID, they would send somebody to your house um, to take your blood and do a couple of tests um, and just, you know, verify some of your things. Um, sometimes they request copies of medical records. So if you had a record that you had a colonoscopy, like they want to see a, a copy of it from your medical providers. And um, so it's actually a pretty like detailed and thorough um, process to approve you for insurance. Because if you claim that you're in good health, you're going to get way cheaper rates than if you have other conditions. And they want to validate that you actually you know, are, are um, supposed to be getting those uh, cheaper rates. Hopefully this was helpful. And I would like to kick off our three key takeaways by saying that number one, life insurance is going to be extremely valuable and worth buying for most people. I am very anti-insurance as an industry, as I've made very clear, but the risk of losing a lifetime of income from somebody in your family for almost everybody is going to be severe and you should have protection against that. As you get later in your life and as you as your wealth grows, it becomes less important. And so my f- personal feelings about the industry aside, this is an important product for people to have. And you know, we didn't really talk about kids a lot here, but it's like if you have kids to support is when it's more important. If you're just dinks, dual dinks, income, no kids, dual income, no kids. And and your other partner or spouse works and, you know, makes a decent living, like you don't need life insurance. Like they're going to they're going to be, you know, devastated if something happens to you, but they're not going to be financially destitute if something happens to you. Mm-hmm. It's when you've got kids and, you know, m- much more, you know, complex situations to manage. Okay. Number two is understand what you need, like I just said, around kids, et cetera, um, and how it all works, because it, it is important as you're making these decisions, just, you know, read a couple articles, listen to a podcast like this and, and understand what you're getting into. And then number three, 
shop around for the best pricing, and don't get sucked into buying more insurance than you need. Figure out what what you really need to keep your family healthy in the future and buy that. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. If you've been challenged or inspired by what you have heard today, you can rate and review the show. We would greatly appreciate it. You can also subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you have any thoughts or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Or Matt, if you want to call in and tell us some detective stories on Uh our voicemail. We'd love it. Leave us a message or text us at 404-981-3370 or hit us up on Instagram or Facebook. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Maggie. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye.